1 Corinthians 14, as we continue our marriage series, like I said, I didn't have hardly any time to study this, but I, we'll try to get going on something and maybe we'll continue it next week. I wanted to point to this little principle in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. It tells us, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Look over at verse 8, please. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? This passage, of course, you know, is coming in, in the context of tongues in the church. And Paul was making clear that during this transitionary period, yes, tongues are a thing during this specific period, but it should not be something that adds confusion. In fact, tongues should be something that brings clarity. But I draw these verses, and I still use these verses because I believe we can, as general principles of God not being the author of confusion. God doesn't, I believe, gender confusion when it comes to any doctrine or any church service. His goal when people go indoors and leave doors of church houses is that they have a strong sense of what the truth is. There it is. They don't leave more confused than when they came in. They leave with a better idea of God's word, God's truth. I say this, and I say this in the context of marriage because we're, we're going through this series right and oftentimes I'll defend the, the permanence of marriage position and I'll give you reasons why I defend it but in my opinion the permanence of marriage position is a very clear position as the scriptures say two become one until death and then you play that out it's very easy to explain to preach to teach and whether you agree with that or not agree with that I hope you will at least agree that it's a very clear position Beyond that, you have churches that have all kinds of different tangled up messes of, well, sometimes it's permanent, but it's not really permanent. And then if you do this, it can be permanent, but it's not unto death. And then I'll show some examples this morning of what I believe is confusion. And where confusion is, I believe, is room for people to study further and decide what sound doctrine really is. Because sound doctrine is not to be confusing. It should be a trumpet with a certain sound is what should be coming out of churches today. It's an important thing, too. You think about the warning of a trumpet, you think about battle. The trumpet would sound and people would be ready for the war, for the danger. It's important to, to find what you believe, study the topic of marriage, and preach it strongly because we know from Scripture, and we've already read it before, we know that marriage is important in God's sight. And we know that breaking the bonds of marriage is, is abominable in God's sight. Hebrews 13, 4 tells us, let me read it for you again. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. The Bible tells us this marriage is an honorable thing created by God. And it tells us that those who practice um, whoremongering or fornication or adultery there's judgment there. So truly, churches, Christians, we need to figure out, well, what's honorable marriage and what is adultery? So we can sound this trumpet so people aren't judged in their lives. We have every reason to study this topic, but sadly, many churches don't. We also know from the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ, he told us that, he, he taught us of not just adultery of, you know, someone sleeping with their neighbor, which is just common adultery, but Christ put a finer tip on it and explained us very clearly that if this neighbor, for instance myself, if I divorce my wife, Emma, if I divorce her and then marry my neighbor, it's also adultery. It's just glorified, sanctified adultery. Christ tells us that throughout the Gospels. Okay, but that's what you have today, isn't it? We, though I think society still kind of looks down on, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't cheat on your spouse. But what we've done is we've neglected Christ's instructions and we said, well, if you go get a piece of paper from the judge, then you can cheat on your spouse. Because we've changed it, right? Well, Christ was very plain. He tells us in passages such as Luke 16, 18, whosoever put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery. So Christ says, no, that don't go. That don't go. This made up thing called divorce, it doesn't give you an excuse to go sleep with your neighbor's spouse. We are called as Christians to warn the wicked. It tells us in Ezekiel 33, 8, If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. 
I'm setting this up to tell us that churches, you can't, we can't just push it off as a small doctrine, unimportant doctrine. We have to realize that we have to decide there is sin here on this topic. What is sin? What isn't sin? And we need to warn once we decide what sin is. Warn. Okay, so I want to get in some views of other churches, but before we go, let's talk about the clarity that I see in Scripture and our position real quickly. Now, I don't know if you share it with me exactly in this church or not, but this is how we see it. We see marriage as unto death without exception. Today, that position is viewed as crazy, right? Crazy, 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 crazy. But let's just think about this real fast. The position we hold that marriage is until death is exactly what we say in our wedding vows, right? Until death do us part. We all say it, even in churches that don't believe in it, that they still say it. Divorce in history was so uncommon. It wasn't, it did not even exist in, the, in America. In the colonies, it did not even exist. And even further, divorce and remarriage was even more unheard of, okay? So the position we hold is actually the traditional position of the church, of our nation. It would not be viewed as crazy 150 years ago, 100 years ago. We also have studied how man created divorce and how nowhere in scripture do we see a picture of God telling people to divorce and remarry. You never see it. There's no example. There's none. So there's no, there's no proof text for people to say we should. Beyond that, we've already studied. The Bible clearly tells us that marriage is until death, does it not? Romans 7 verse 3 says, The woman is, which hath an husband is bound by the law right, until her husband dies. That's what Romans 7 tells us. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39 says the same thing. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. I know I'm reading a lot. We'll get in some passage here for you to look at with me in a second. These are some things we've already covered. The Bible clearly says marriage is until death. Christ clearly tells us to remarry is adultery. You find that in Luke 16, 18, Mark 9, or Matthew 19, Mark 10, Romans 7, and even in this picture, the story of John the Baptist, you see that remarriage is adultery. And then throughout the scriptures, you see this call for reconciliation. We've studied this already at length. God's call for reconciliation, the goal for when a marriage hits rocky times, is not to be in looking for, well, is there an out here? Is there an exception? The goal for every church and every Christian should be how can we reconcile this situation? We get this from many places, from Christ's very words. He told us for, to forgive how many times? Not until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So me as a pastor, I'm never going to issue the, the counsel of, well, this has been the fifth time they've messed up, it's done. I'm never going to have scriptural authority to do that. Yet pastors act as if they do. It's not true. We see from the story of God and Israel the wonderful picture of reconciliation despite people going against him century after century. But God still reconciles with Israel. That bond is never broken. In the story of Hosea, you see God tell that prophet who had an adulterous wife. He says in Hosea 3.1, he tells Hosea, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress. He says to keep that marriage in place despite the infidelity. Reconciliation is seen in Malachi chapter 2, the picture of God and Israel. In 1 Corinthians 7, reconciliation is what churches should be calling for. I said all that and I said it quickly because I wanted to save time for what do other churches preach? Are their positions tenable? My wife, who uh, is always helping me out in different ways, I, I had, it was about 11 o'clock last night, got to do some studying for tomorrow. I asked her to start looking through church websites at what other churches are teaching on this topic of divorce, remarriage. And so she did some searching for me. I had done some searching a while back. But you know the first thing you find about what most churches say about divorce free marriage? The first thing you'll notice is that they don't say anything. Hardly anything. In this valley, it was hard for us to find a church that had any position stated on the topic of divorce free marriage. It's, it's an anomaly. It's confusing because the sin of adultery is mentioned 56 times in Scripture. 
56 times, including 28 times in the New Testament, including many times right out of the words of our Savior Jesus Christ. But churches today don't have information on it on their websites. They don't preach sermons on it. They don't even touch it. Why? Why? Because it is the idol of our day. It's the idol of our day that we can't touch because everyone kind of has the idol. So if you mention it, then someone's going to get upset. It's like if they're not, if my own members aren't in the sin, then their grandparents are, or their father is, or their son or daughter is. It's the idol. It's the original idol of the church. is divorce, remarriage, adultery. So all the churches stop talking about it. And that's when they did the world a huge disservice. What you'll find is most churches will not even talk about it. And they should, if they're true prophets, they should sound the trumpet and say there's judgment involved when people go into adultery. There's judgment involved. There are even passages that tell us plainly that, you know, the fornicators and adulterers shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There's even a clear picture on this topic that those who live in these sins, they never knew the Savior. And they need the Savior. Every, there's every reason to preach on this topic. You'll find today, and I want to put this as something for you to think about, many churches are still okay. Well, I shouldn't say many. A few churches are still okay with preaching against gay marriage. Okay? And you'll find some sermons going out about this. Right? And they're, they're treading this water now of it's starting to get harder for them to preach this because pretty soon they're like, well... We've got people in our church who are in that sin, or, or their, their son or daughter, they're now, they're now gay, so we've got to stop talking about it. You're going to see the same pattern that you saw with adultery. Sin, 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 until everybody commits it, then don't talk about it. It's the same thing you're going to see with, with gay marriage. Sin, 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 oh, but now the whole church is filled with it, or they're related to people filled with it, so don't talk about it. It's called ear tickling. It's called church is not worth their salt. Many Baptist churches are preaching marriage is between a man and a woman, but it's completely crickets when it comes to adultery. So what we see from other churches, first, no mention of the sin at all. The second thing that we see are these words, and it's almost verbatim across websites that even mention it. They will say, God intends, God intends for marriage to be until death. But whatever. <laughs> That's pretty much the next sentence. God intends for it, but uh, whatever. <laughs> They'll write this reason, that reason, this reason, that reason. Look in, in your Bibles in uh, Mark chapter 10 real quick. That's not the way God describes marriage. Kind of like I, I wanted it to be this way, but... Uh, Let's look first at Mark 10, verse 6. Mark 10, 6. And we'll put that, that analogy, that comparator in there. Look at Mark 10, 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. That's a dogmatic sentence, isn't it? God made them male and female. Well, if we're hip like the rest of the churches today, we could say, well, God intended for male and female, but uh, whatever. <laughs> whatever. God intended it that way. Would we do that? What would you call me if I started doing that? You'd, you'd probably walk out and be like, this guy's disingenuous with the scriptures. He's just trying to please people. He's trying to get, grow a new audience. He's trying to be woke, right? Like everybody else. That's what you'd say. Well, that's what, the, that's what the church has already done when it comes to marriage. Look down at verse 9, 10, 9. Well, let's look at 10, 8. Let's read into it. 10, 8. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Does that sound like intend? God intended for two to become one. Uh, but whatever, <laughs> whatever. Look at verse 9. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. But whatever, but whatever. He intended for it to happen. That's not the words of Scripture. Words of Scripture are very plain. God did this. God created marriage in such a way that it was a male and female come together until death. Right? We can't say that there were the, the God's rules and then just these other things upended God's rules. It's not true. So you find that, and I'm, I'm generalizing some, but this is the central theme is those words God intended or God's plan for marriage was this, but then everybody broke God's plan, so now it's anything goes. That's not a tenable position in Scripture. Look at, uh, or uh, let me give you the third one. The third one we saw was this one. This is throughout many, many churches. 
some of the, I think I might do a whole sermon or a whole Sunday school lesson on reform preachers because boy, they bug me. They act like they're scholars, but they come to some of the most illogical conclusions on some things, including on divorce remarriage. So people like Vody Bauckham, John Piper, Paul Washer, you know, people revere these, whoa, these guys are really spiritual gurus of scripture. Most of their churches, when they come to this topic, what they say is, yeah, it's wrong. Divorce or marriage is wrong, but God forgives. But God forgives. Uh, let's study this just for a second. Let's study this for a second, because it's important. It's important. Does God, can, let's say, can God forgive sin? As we study this, let's look, look over at Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Today might be a little bit of a repeat on some things we've said, but we put it all together. I think you'll see the picture of what other churches are preaching. It's just untenable. Look at uh, Psalm 50, please. God forgives. God forgives. I like it. It sounds good. God does forgive. He saved my soul. Forgive me my sins. I absolutely believe it. But let's study this a little deeper as students of God's Word. Look at Psalm 50, verse 18. I just love the phrasing here. Look at 50, 18. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. In this verse, well, 17 is good too. Look at 17. Seeing thou hatest instruction, and casteth my words behind thee. That's what people have done with divorce and remarriage doctrine. They've thrown it in the trash can. 18 likens, or puts in parallel, this idea of stealing and adultery. Puts them in the same verse, in Psalm 50, verse 18. It's helpful because I always use the analogy, and I think you're probably sick of it by now, but think about being forgiven of sin. I believe in forgiveness. Who does? God forgives, absolutely. But let's say you've got a thief. It says, thou sawest a thief. So if you have a thief who goes and steals from Albertsons over here, can that thief be forgiven? We'd all say, yes, certainly can be forgiven, can he? Okay. But should that thief go back tomorrow and steal some more? Should they go back the day after that and steal some more? Who says yes? Well, they were forgiven. They were forgiven. You can't stay, you can't keep stealing. Divorce, remarriage, adultery is just that. It is stealing the marriage bed. It's something that does not belong to you. It belongs to somebody else. Divorce, remarriage, adultery, by any passage in Scripture or even logically, you've got to conclude it's not the sin. So let's talk about my wife and I. We've got neighbors. Heaven forbid, let's not talk about that, but think about that too deeply. But we've got neighbors, okay? So if I file that piece of paper, was that the sin? God says he hates it, but the reason he hates it is because it's going to lead to some problems. Okay? So if I go issue the piece of paper, and I go move in with Donna down the street. I don't think there was a Donna down the street, but I move in with Donna. Okay? So what are you all going to say? God's going to forgive. Logan, God forgives. He'll forgive you that time you signed that piece of paper. It's all done. It's done, it's done, it's done. It. Is that really how we should view it? No, I'm, I'm living with somebody who is not my wife. Emma's my wife. We're having relations. That's called we're stealing the, from the marriage bed. It's a continual sin. There's no way around it. One of the biggest things that the world of Christians need to simply accept is that it's a continual sin. People say, I've heard people say, you know, well, your, your, your position, like it's the unforgivable sin well, all sin can be forgiven, but should you stay in any sin? No, you should not. Shall we sin that, that grace may abound? Romans tells us, Romans chapter 6. No, we should not. We can't keep doing it. Think about this. The, the, the gay marriage analogy is actually perfect for this. It helps people finally start to understand some of these things. Think about the gay marriage analogy. So two gay men get married. The judge signs a piece of paper. They sign the marriage certificate, have a ceremony. Boom. Can God forgive that? Yeah, he can forgive that. Do you recommend they keep, they keep living together? Let's just say it that way. Do you recommend it? No. No Christian with a sane mind who knows anything about the Bible would say, yeah, it's not the unforgivable sin. <laughs> It's not unpardonable. Just, just ask for forgiveness for that little ceremony you had and then keep living with each other. 
No one would say that on any, any uh, continent in this world who has a sane mind. Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Romans 6.15. So the whole forgiveness thing, it's a disingenuous argument from the church. And the reason I mentioned some of those guys like Piper and Washer and Bauckham, they know the scriptures. It's called they're twisting the scriptures to accommodate sin among their members when they know for a fact people should not stay with somebody who is not their spouse. Should not stay in sin. Should not keep stealing from a store. Does that make sense? Sometimes that's a whole new concept for people, but there's no other way to view it. The sin of divorce, remarriage, adultery is what you saw with Abraham's wife, right? In that a king, was, God looks down and says, Thou art but a dead man, for you're going to go with somebody who's not your wife. That's what God sees when he looks down. When I cheat on my spouse, Emma, God looks down and he says, you're, you're, you're sin. You're just living in sin. Not a good place to be in any Christian. It, let's just say, let's play this out. If I did this, what would you tell me? Now yeah, Logan's a good old boy. We're going to forgive him. We're going to forgive him. How loving is that? How loving is that for me? Because I'm going to see God's wrath on my life, guaranteed. I'm a Christian. God's going to chastise me as a son. He's going to slap me in line and say, get back with your spouse. How loving is that towards me if you don't tell me the truth? Not loving at all. And then think even deeper. How loving is that for Emma? I've told you as we've preached this series, I'm meeting more and more people who are the spouse like Emma would be in this example. Who are waiting to reconcile, reconcile, reconcile. But no Christians and no churches are telling me to get out of that adulterous relationship and go back to my wife. All the churches are saying that, well, God forgives. God is love. It's not forgiveness and it's not love. It's all smoke and mirrors, this divorce, remarriage, adultery. And by the way, would it be love for my children? Let's play this out further. I'm liking this. I like pointing the, the target right at myself. So let's say I'm in this new relationship with this woman down the street. Donna, I think her name was. I don't know. I didn't marry her for her name. That's obvious. But living with Donna and we have a baby. And some, and some, you've heard some preachers call that an anchor baby, which is just a mean thing to say, isn't it? Sorry. I have a child with this new spouse and uh, got a kid. That must mean God's blessing the whole situation, right? No, it means we had physical relations and that just kind of happens that way, okay? Happens. People have children out of wedlock too. Okay, so now I got this new marriage though. So now, you know what most pa pastors would say? Well, Logan, Logan. No, they tell you, I guess. Don't break up the family. Don't break up that family. It's a new family. It's a nice family. Don't break it up. Well, the first family was broken up pretty darn good, wasn't it? Now you got another family started here. What, what's the answer? Churches will struggle with this. They'll give all kinds of confusing answers. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe go, maybe go back. Maybe stay. Confusion. You know what I say? You're, you're married until death. I can give every person I meet a very clear answer. Well, you've you got a nice baby. He's a beautiful baby. Wonderful little baby. But you married... Now I'm talking to myself, to myself. Sorry, it's confusing. But you married Emma. And you've got three kids, four kids, five kids there. I forget what you said. you got a lot of kids there. <laughs> okay? Think about that. That's why, you know, I, I talk about John the Baptist a lot, don't I? Well, he's a wonderful example of bringing forward a hard truth. Because remember, Herodias was married to Philip. They had a marriage. They, they both got divorced. They, I mean, they divorced each other. And then uh, Herodias married Herod. That was Philip's brother. And Herod had divorced his spouse. It was a whole new family. They got Herod... And Herodias and the daughter there dancing, right? A happy little family. What does John the Baptist do? He came up and quoted God's law and said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He called Herodias Philip's wife. Despite the divorce, despite the remarriage, he said, no, you're still married there. I take those words from John the Baptist as all the, all, there's more in there, but all the evidence I need that today, when you see somebody living in divorce, remarriage, adultery, you have scriptural authority to say, you're still married to the first spouse. I'm sorry, but it's just the truth of God's word. It's two become one until death. So if you ever see me living with Donna, please come up and tell me that. Please come. It would be absolute love if you told me that. That was a long point there on 
God forgives. But I hope you understand it. Hope you understand it. There's forgiveness anywhere, but forgiveness is never an excuse to stay in sin. Never. And divorce or marriage adultery is continual sin. How about this one? And we're using up all the time pretty swiftly, aren't we? How about this one? This is one that you also see quite often. Let's look over at, um, well, let me talk it through. I'm sorry, I do a lot of talking, but I hope you have seen the verses that we've already brought forward on this. How about this one? Many, many churches say this. They might combine it with a God forgives or they might combine it with a God intends kind of sentence, but they'll say this. They'll say, it's wrong. Divorce or marriage is wrong. And they'll say, our pastors and our deacons shouldn't do it. But you can. But you can. Have you ever seen that before? Let's just break that down. So, these church, so let me give you a quote. My wife looked this up. Let's look it up from a church uh, that we were looking up recently. Um, East Hill Baptist Church in Kent, Washington. But there's their phrase is like most others. It says, we believe that God disapproves of divorce and ordained marriage to last until one of the spouses dies. <laughs> so he's saying, see, God ordained, God created marriage to be until the death. But then it goes on to say, divorced and remarried persons or divorced persons may hold positions of service in the church and be greatly used of God for Christian service, but they may not be considered for the offices of pastor or deacon. Let's just break this down, okay? You've got people living in divorce and remarriage adultery. The church says that they can be used greatly of God for Christian service. If this is true, it'd be the first sin in the Bible. You can stay in that sin and be greatly used for Christian service. Let's think about the gay analogy again. Well, <laughs> you know, you're in that homosexual lifestyle. You can't be a pastor or a deacon, but boy, you can be used for God's work here at Truth Baptist Church. There's a place for you. Right in service alongside the saints as you're living in sin. Does that make any sense to you whatsoever? No sense whatsoever. Romans 7, 3 tells us present tense. Look at that. In case, in case you haven't seen that, just look real quickly. Romans 7, 3. Now, for some of you, maybe it's a newer topic. For others, you're saying, Logan, this is the 100th time you've showed me Romans 7, 3. Churches, it's compromise. It's trying to build congregations based on the acceptance of sin, and it's plain wicked. And I'm not going to do it that way, and everybody will be mad at me. I will have no fellowship with other churches, not because I don't desire it, but because they don't want my poisonous belief in the permanence of marriage heard by their congregants. Cause too much trouble, too much conviction. Look at Romans 7, 3. Or, or 7, uh, 2, either one. That's the 7, 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. 3. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. That's what the Bible says, Romans 7, 3. Called an adulteress, that means you're living in the sin of adultery. It's present tense, it's not past tense, it's meaning you're living in sin. But most churches, including this one I just mentioned here, this East Hill Baptist, would say, but you can still be used in a mighty way for God's service. It's ear tickling, it's just plain wrong. Plain wrong. It says, um, what, so what does the Bible tell us about this? I've been counseling people more and more about this. So what should you do? It gets hard. I, don't, I do not admit that it, I do not deny that it gets hard. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What should a church do when someone goes into sin? <laughs> to be honest, it's easy for about any sin, except for this one that's our special pet sin now. 1 Corinthians 5, and look at verse 13. So if you recall, in this chapter, someone's found in sin, and we learn a lesson here about what happens when a church member is living in sin and they won't stop. They're, they want to continue in it. 1 Corinthians 5, 13. But them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. It talks about in verse 6 how you know, the whole lump is leavened by this sin. It's a great passage on what a church should do. And it makes common, it's common sense, isn't it? So let's say that one of you, brethren, I love you all, but say one of you gets into let's just, drunkenness for no specific reason. Drunkenness. And you come to the service drunk, and I say, that's wrong. Okay? And you say, oh, sorry, but I'm going to do it next week. And you come to the service next week, you're drunk. And the service after that, you're drunk. What should the church do? He's completely said that he's gonna, he wants to stay in this sin. He's not making any attempt to get out of it. He doesn't believe he should, he should get out of it. The church would say, I'm sorry, there's the door. 
We're a church that's striving towards holiness. We know we're not perfect, but we cannot accept the idea that we should just stay in the mud. Okay? We are pigs always trying to get out of the mud. We're all pigs. We're all sinners. But it's the ones who say, no, I'm just going to live in the mud. Those are the ones who say, there's the door. Right? Put away from yourselves that wicked person, the Bible tells us. So that's how it plays out for divorce, marriage, adultery. You're gonna go, you're gonna, I'm going to go join this person with this neighbor. You say, Logan, there's the door. You're willfully just going down this path that every one of us know is wrong. This is not the only passage. If you look over um, in Ephesians 5, let me read it real quickly for you. Ephesians 5, 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. That's Ephesians 5, 3. Remember, 1 Corinthians 5, Ephesians 5 are two passages that talk about church discipline. Okay? I've got no time, but I want to show you this. I want to, I want to show you why they say that thing about, well... The church member can sin, but the pastors and deacons can't sin. Look real quickly. Our last thing we look at is 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is called, this is called intelligent men resting the scriptures to accommodate sin. That's the only name for it. Look at 1 Timothy 3. These are the qualifications for a, a bishop, and it talks about later the qualifications for a deacon, and they say some of the same stuff. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Now watch that. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. It goes on and on. It gives some some um, requirements to be a pastor. This is where the church, wanting to compromise and embrace sin among its members, takes this and runs with it a mile. So look at verse 3 and verse 2 again. says that the bishop should be the husband of one wife. They tie that to divorce and remarriage. Which, 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 just start back a little bit. I don't believe that's talking about polygamy. Maybe in some stretch of a way it is. Polygamy at this time, here at this time, among the Gentiles especially, it's not even a thing, okay? So I don't believe it's talking about polygamy. I believe it's talking about what it says in 3, 2, the husband of one wife. I believe it's using the same words that Christ used with the woman at the well. Remember Christ says, thou hast had five husbands, but he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. He's just saying you've had five of these things called husbands, but they're not really husbands. It's the same thing here. In 3.1, if, if a pastor's had these things, I've had, at first I had Emma, then I had Donna, then I moved on to Sally. I've had three wives, but in God's eyes, I only had one, right? That's what I believe it's talking about. Multiplicity of wives through divorce and remarriage. And in fact, many churches agree with my interpretation of it. But what they say then is, this, is, this shows us that divorce remarriage is a problem, it's a sin, but only the pastors and deacons aren't allowed to commit this sin. Other people can commit this sin. I ask you, what other sin is there that's like that? Is there any other sin? There's no such thing. Sin is sin. You can't say, well, the pastors and deacons, they shouldn't get drunk, but if you all want to have a good party, you go for it. There's no such thing. It's illogical. You can say the same again. You can say the same thing about gay marriage. Well, and that's what some churches are doing right now. Well, just, you know, like, homosexuals, they can't be pastors or deacons, but it's fine beyond that. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever in Scripture. Sin is sin is sin is sin. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. But did that help explain that passage? Divorce, remarriage, if it's wrong for one, it's wrong for the other. I guess I had a few more notes, but we are out of time. You'll see that same phrase in another place. Again, so you want to know my clear my, my interpretation of it is that, is that um, it's speaking of multiplicity of wives and divorce and marriage, and it's wrong for one, it's wrong for the other. Okay? All right. Oh, we're out of time. But if you have any questions, you ever want to talk about anything with me, just let me know. Please, we'll, we'll talk about it. But these messages are important to preach because no one else is preaching them. We'll be a church that still tells the truth and we'll love people, we'll love relationships, we'll love the kids. We'll reach them with this message that the clear, honest, unconfusing truth of Scripture is that two become one until death, just as our Savior said. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd um, please bless us in this next service, Lord, now as we look truly at the Savior, Jesus Christ. We just this morning talked about sin, Lord. And Lord, we know that's why you sent the Savior. 
There's salvation in Christ, Lord. There's freedom in Christ. There's liberty in Christ. But Lord, to our point this morning, it's never freedom to sin. It's never liberty to sin. It's, it's Lord, in Christ Jesus, we have the saving of our souls. And Lord, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we have all the power we need to get out of sin, to get out of some of these relationships that bind us or that we know we're not supposed to be in. Help us preach this message. Lord, I pray that you do work in lives that pull people out of the path of destruction and darkness, on the path, Lord, of salvation, of service for our King, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen.